ago. As Dr. Harris once said, I have here a letter from the Viet Cong. Um, but I don't actually have a little bit of bio stuff here. And uh, I think I can actually do that. But I have a little bio stuff here on Brooke. Brooke and I are friends and we go back to the University of Oregon where he has stayed and I have left. Um, but he stayed a good effect there. And I want to just introduce him a little bit and turn it over to him. I'm glad that y'all came. I think you have uh, come to I believe will be a very good talk. Um, Brooke was, has just stepped down as the interim dean of the Architecture and Allied Arts program at the University of Oregon. The Architecture School at the University of Oregon consistently is accredited being one of the top, if not the top, green architecture schools in the United States. Um, he's been in practice um, in Stuttgart, and I think it's important to be in practice in Stuttgart just so you have the ability to say Stuttgart. <laughs> Um, but he was a co-project leader on uh, European Union Green Building Project while he was there and went to a 100 operas. Yes, right? I did. He went to 100 operas in Germany. That alone makes him an expert. Um, he, what he does is he works with ecologists to look at site level scale projects and uh, my tagline on what you do is that you try to increase density and ecological capacity at the same moment. Um, really, truly smart growth instead of just density uh, or open space, and that's what really sold me on this family, and that is when I was at both. He directs the grad certificate in, in ecological design at UBO. He's a core faculty in the environmental site sciences uh, program there. His book, Ecology and Architectural Imagination came out in 2014. I got to write my first little jacket puff ever for that, which was fun. Um, and it's a good one. The thing that I like about Brooke Muller and the reason I invited him to come here is that he is a professor who still reads and stretches his mind. He's always reading things that are outside of his, quote, outside of his discipline, or he into his discipline. He synthesizes stuff really well, which is very, very important in this time. That. Um, I would say that he is an intellectual, and I mean that in the best sense, and an actor in what is shaping up to be the age of cities. And um, most importantly, I think what he does and the work that he does points a direction towards what I would call the new infrastructure and the new landscape. And I think it's something that 100 years now would be just a de rigueur, but it's still very cutting edge at this point. So with that in mind, I need you from the good keepings with Dr. Miller. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. So let's just be clear. The reason I went to 100 op operas, I rented rooms from the director of the Stuttgart Opera, and she would call me when I worked at Banish Partner Architects and say her booth was available. So I'd bring some friends, some Germans, some from other countries, and I'd go, and all my German friends knew every opera through and through, and I recognize some from Bugs Bunny cartoons, just to, <laughs> just to put things into perspective here, okay? But I did, actually I worked, Tom Hurt should be arriving soon, he's gonna be a little bit late. I worked with Tom Hurt, Tom Hurt Architecture, it's a really excellent practice here in town, I work very closely with Tom. Um, I'm honored to be here, and one of the reasons for that is there are people who have been affiliated with this school whose work has influenced mine significantly, one of those individuals is in the first row, Stephen Moore. I would also have to acknowledge the indebtedness that I have to Robert, and we miss him a lot. I'm speaking on behalf of many of my colleagues at U of O. If there's something called an economic stim stimulus package, I would call him an intellectual stimulus package. He's witty and incisive, and his, his deep historical knowledge, I think, for me at least, it illuminates our contemporary experience. So what I would like to talk about uh, this evening is the manner in which, as Robert mentioned, site-scale works of architecture can support broader ecosystem processes and urban environments. Talk about synergies between uh, sustainable buildings and climate-adaptive ur urban landscapes. Um, we can put these two things together and make it easier for both, both realms to talk about um, a sort of water-centric approach to architecture which I'm increasingly excited about, the idea of architecture and water infrastructure as being hybridized in effect, and all in the cause of thinking about cities as places of biological possibility 
and, and I'm not going to touch on this as much, but we could also connect this to issues of social equity. So I'm going to start by sharing uh, with you a project that I, this kind of a foundational project at Banish and Partner in Stuttgart. Back in the 90s, I showed up and they just started this competition for the Dutch Institute for Forestry and Nature Research. And so essentially there were these um, research entities throughout the Netherlands, there's wildlife biology and aquatic ecology, landscape ecology, and on and on and on. And they wanted to bring them all together under one roof so that there would be a more collaboration taking place. The site was in Wageningen in the eastern part of the Netherlands and it was basically a cornfield so the biological value of this site was not very much. So we had this idea as a formative design move of introducing the system of gardens, postage stamp shaped gardens that march across the site and different gardens represent different biotopes of the Netherlands. So there's a marsh garden, a woodland garden, a grassland garden, and the like. We had this idea of, that the building grows between the gardens. This is going to happen a few times. I'll try to minimize, minimize the damage. So these are the office wings. And you usually think of the landscape as the thing that's dynamic and grows around the building. And we wanted to invert that and think of the, the Whoops, that we wanted to think about the landscape as first and foremost, and that the building gained purchase by virtue of how it was situated. So I have a question for you. Another formative move was to actually separate the labs, that's that bar on the top to the north, and the offices. So if we're interested in energy conservation, why would we, as a formative move, separate the offices and the labs? Quiz question number one. Very important. Any keep them at different temperatures? Keep going. I'm um, assuming labs maybe can be cooler than the offices, and offices need to be at a hotter temperature. You're getting them. there. It basically, they, we have no choice but to actively ventilate labs because of the compounds that people will be working with. So we talk about local solutions to local problems. If we can pull the offices away, we could passively condition the offices, and that's what we do. So that. Between the office wings, we span these greenhouses, and it's single glazed, off the shelf technology that's cheap and ubiquitous in the Netherlands. And those serve as energy buffers for the building. So, in the summertime, you deploy shade cloths over the greenhouses to prevent overheating, and at night, you open the building up, engage fan assisted um, flushing of the thermal mass of the concrete structure of the offices. In the wintertime, you do the opposite, you gather the sun's solar radiation, you deploy the shade cloths at night to insulate. And so there's no air conditioning in this project. Um, minimize mechanical systems for the offices. There's talk about green buildings necessarily being a lot more expensive. This is a very inexpensive building. It was considerably cheaper in terms of cost per square foot than a typical office building built in the Netherlands at this time. So it's basically because we have this preliminary layer the greenhouse roof, that meant the facades could be much more porous in their detailing. So they're single glazed facades. It's basically a double skin facade and we just lifted one up to the roof and formed a space. We collect all the rainwater from the roof, from the greenhouses, goes to a green roof, makes its way to a cistern, portions of which are daylit. We collaborated with an artist named Michael Singer on the cistern design use that water for the plants. The evapotranspiration of the plants produces a cooling effect. So it's basically a really simple set of systems interacting with one another to provide comfort and hopefully some element of delight. And so there's this notion that, be, that an office in this cold northern European climate could be something different. Maybe you could actually work in the garden. And so, the two lessons for me, the landscape as a formative design move, creating a landscape structure. And then the other thing for me is that you have a notion about the culture of the place or sociability, a diagram about how people are going to interact. And you have a diagram pertaining to environmental response. And those things are the same. They're identical. The systems are not back of house. They are the spaces that you occupy. Lastly, and this wasn't realized, here's a model from above, competition model. We have this idea of this green wall on the north, just you know, proud of the laboratories. And what we were going to do is 
plant uh, telephone poles 25 feet apart or so, tie reed mats across them, let the plants grow up, uh, plant poplars and other fast growing trees, and create this green billboard. Most people arriving to the site for the first time come from the train station to the north, so their first view of this project would be this green billboard, which seems like a nice thing for a natu nature research center. But we also had this idea that there's a hedgerow to the east and a forested a margin to the west, and maybe we could create some kind of landscape connectivity so that a site scale proposition could be linked to a broader uh, sort of landscape ecological network. So it didn't really work. It was an architect's thought. But it led me to go down the road. Let's start working with urban ecologists and landscape ecologists. So I partner very closely with a guy named Josh Sarah, who has a wildlife ecology background, who's a landscape architect at Cornell, and uh, Mark Wilson, who's an urban ecologist who works in Portland. And they turned me on to the whole underworld or the invisible world of urban environments. So for example, there are many pollinator communities that are doing a lot better in urban environments than they are in rural ones because they're not being subject to pesticides and fertilizers. And there's native amphibian populations living in constructed bioswales in Portland because the hydrologies are match their sort of uh, life cycle histories, actually. And they serve as refugia because these invasive amphibians are taking out all their territory in non-urban environments. And on and on. And I'm not saying this is good habitat for a, for a native frog, but it's really interesting. There are people engaged in thinking about the city as a tremendous carbon sink. There are people like Alexander Felsen at Yale who has a joint position in environmental studies and architecture who's looking at the grid of the city as a perfect sort of framework for experimentation. You've created a grid, so he measures canopy coverage or other things using the grid as, again, that framework. All kinds of ways, this explosion of knowledge about urban ecologies, the long-term ecological research project, uh, the cities of Baltimore and Phoenix, there's also tr some tremendous insights coming out of that work. So then I started looking at our architects interested in this, and we did a little periodical search of architectural review and so architectural periodicals uh, from two th in 2013. And just in the span of a couple months, we found architects using these words to describe contemporary projects. So uh, it's, uh, evidently, we are interested in biological phenomenon. Most of these terms route through, I'd say, uh, evolutionary developmental biology and cybernetics. And, digital media culture and the like. But it's an interesting and promising phenomenon. However, what I would argue is what we tend to do is we take small scale, organism scale biological phenomenon like the skins of bugs and we scale them up to the skins of buildings. So we make facades that track the light or that respire or whatever they do. And that can be a really good thing. It may make for better building performance. It may make for more attractive and comfortable building, so that's not a bad thing. But my concern is we're going to make build bug buildings the aggregate of which will help perpetuate the decline of urban populations. And so is there a way that we could actually make buildings that are actually not just taking cues from biology but supporting these processes? Even uh, the Acadia Conference Adaptive Architects follows that logic. We're going to make buildings that uh, behave like organisms. Again, I think it's promising, but I think there's more potential here for synergies to be derived. Or even something as amazing and wonderful as the Living Building Challenge, this is aggressive environmental performance rating for buildings. Again, we look at the source for the metaphor is an, 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 animated natural world, and we use that to think about how we make buildings. Um, my former student and now Professor Leonard Yui, with some irony, wrote a thesis on the dead building challenge. He thinks that would be a better thing to do instead of the living building challenge, by which he means the metaphor is dead wood in a forest ecosystem. So when a windstorm knocks a tree down, it's bad for the tree, but it's really good for the system. Sequestered resources suddenly become available. There's a snag that is this nutrient-rich purchase for all kinds of life forms. Could we even begin to imagine that architectures operate along these lines? 
So to give you a sense for how this might work, um, one thing we know that public spending is not going to deal with the fact that we're experiencing the sixth mass extinction in the history of the world. Um, and so we've been working with uh, Metro, Portland Metro, the only elected regional government in the United States, interestingly. And among, so they coordinate transportation planning and um, all kinds of other things within the Portland metropolitan region, the 23 municipalities that make it up. And what they've done is map habitat conservation areas. These might be riparian corridors or upland habitat or wetland complexes the majority of which are on privately owned land. And what they're trying to do is create an incentive-based set of tools for, so for maintaining, preserving the processes, ecosystem processes on those lands such that they will augment the publicly held lands, open spaces and parks that serve as the kind of backbone of functioning ecologies and urban environments. So Josh, my Cornell colleague, and I wrote the briefs for the Integrating Habitats competition a couple years ago, where what we did is we matched development types with habitat types and s saw what might occur. So for example, Greenworks, a really great landscape practice in Portland, won first prize for the category where a commercial big box is adjacent to a wetland complex. This is the reality. This is southwest Portland. The high and dry sites have already been built on. There's an urban growth boundary. The development pressure on these remaining sites is extraordinary. So what we're saying is, through this incentive-based code, if you provide appropriate bufferage, if you decelerate stormwater flows so the water quality entering those wetlands is greater, if you, and you filter that water, if you think about your neighboring sites and anticipate landscape connectivity, which is a really important thing, then what the city of Tualatin is going to do is they're going to relax your parking requirements. They're in residential projects. They'll let you build more units. They'll let you build taller. And so what they're trying to do is incentivize an urban morphology where there's more concentrated development and more landscape connectivity. I've had students even look at this at the species level. So Nick Holmes is looking at the endangered Fender's blue butterfly. This is Eugene. Its larval host plant is the Kincaid's lupin, also endangered. There's a butterfly population to the southwest and the Coburg Hills to the northeast. He's saying we could plant Kincaid's lupin on green roofs and buildings downtown and have that be a stepping stone for the Fender's blue butterfly so it will intermingle with other populations, diversify its gene pool, and have, therefore there's a greater probability of its long-term survival. This is actually happening. Um, this is a pretty spectacular example of this, but Paul Kephart of Rana Creek Living Architecture was the ecological consultant on Renzo Piano's California Academy of Sciences project. And so he's a designer who owns a nursery, and he uh, thinks of green roofs as nurseries for endangered grasses and wildflowers. Um, even sometimes the architects don't know. He calls it eco-sabotage. Um, and there's some really funny stories. So the, there's an architect team in Seattle who said, we want the green roof to blossom white to recall the time when the seabirds flocked to the site. And he said, why don't we create the conditions for the seabirds to flock to the site? We don't have to evoke anything. We can actually, we can actually do this. <laughs> so a green roof, as you know, it's good in terms of reducing the urban heat island effect. It decelerates stormwater, so it's not hitting the storm drains and urban water bodies really quickly, much to their detriment. In this case, this undulating roof creates a thermal stratification effect, which is uh, passive cooling. But the ecologist said, an undulating roof, that's incredible. I usually work with flat roofs, and suddenly you have a sunny side and a shady side, a wet side and a dry side, and I can create much greater levels of diversity on this roofscape and we can conduct experiments and see what actually happens and what they're finding is invertebrate populations are showing up here. Birds making their way up and down the Pacific my, my flyway as a result are showing up here. It's pretty extraordinary. Or another example, Dusty Gedge is an urban ecologist and performer in London and he started off, he was a birder. He was an ornithologist, he loved birds. 
He got into green rooms because ground nesting birds were disappearing around London. They were going extinct. And he thought, maybe I can introduce the plant communities that the birds uh, associate with on these roofs, and maybe these birds will come back. And as it turns out, they are. And so he's become this celebrity. And I have to tell you, the greatest city tour I've ever had was London from Green Roofs with Dusty Gedge. Because we'd go up on a roof, and he'd tell me all about what was happening. We'd go down to the street, he'd chain smoke, we'd get into the underground, we'd come up, we'd go to a bar, everybody'd go, Dusty! He'd, we'd drink a pint, we'd go up to another roof, chain smoke, chain smoke, go down to another bar and a whole other part of the city, Dusty! Um, it was really amazing. So if you ever get to London, I highly recommend reaching out to Dusty Gedge. Okay, so the specific works of architecture can be productive from a sort of biological point of view. So I've been engaged in this work for some time, and now it's really morphed into thinking about water and the built environment, water as the connective tissue between buildings and landscapes. And I think to my own architectural education a generation ago, and I think about the transformations that are taking place right now, and it is truly radical. So I want to go on a little journey. Uh, I'm in riffing off of David James Duncan. He wrote uh, The River Why. Some of you may know that novel. His autobiography, My Story is Told by Water, he grew up in Portland and he's plying the urban creeks and finding these fishing holes and it's just this really beautiful way of experiencing the city. So this is my story of architecture as told by water. And my name is Brooke, by the way, so this, <laughs> there's some logic here. So what I learned, I had in three and a half years of architectural education, two lectures on water, one on flashing details and the other on low flush toilets, okay? <laughs> and those are important things. And so we looked at, in construction class, we look at the typical ubiquitous craftsman style house you see all throughout the Pacific Northwest. And this is a good project because of the roof extends so far beyond the walls. The slope is sufficient. We don't get much snowfall, so you don't need steep. Where you start to get into a little trouble is the brackets and then definitely the rafter tails, which are cut so the end grain is exposed to rain. That's what we call a rot vector. We like to avoid those. I get into practice and I start completely nerding out on smack nuts. So you all have to honestly download <laughs> your flashing details from the smack nut catalog. This is gutters and flashing. It's so cool. Like this is really important. You, like there's nothing more gratifying than a good flashing detail. I'm telling you right now, this is very important. And then we started looking at, the, this is a wonderful book, Le Sturberec, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, and John Carmody of Minnesota, The Moisture Control Handbook, wonderful resource. And they start looking at rain screens, and the idea that you invite water into a cavity where there's no longer any wind pressure acting on it, and then it just drops away. And, really thinking about the physics of building in relationship to water and making sure that buildings endure. Then the next chapter in this journey, I had the great good fortune of going to Australia on a grant. I started my academic career and I spent a couple weeks here at the um, Riversdale Educational Retreat Center designed by Glenn Mar Market. Um, about three hours west of New uh, Sydney, out in the middle of nowhere, and so you have a sleeping quarters here and a meeting space here. Here you can see the sleeping quarters. So this is the north facade where all the sun comes in the southern hemisphere, of course, and you've got the horizontal overhangs. You've got the sh shade fins for the east and west light. These ones actually house pocket doors, which we'll see in a second, which is really cool. And so here you have it. It's off the grid. There's no, you know, in, in electricity infrastructure, you have to capture all the water on site for bathing and cooking and the like. So what do you have? You have elaborated shed roofs that meet in a valley, typical celebrated downspout detail by Merkit that goes to a cistern and that's your water supply. Let's look at the landscape. Elaborated shed roofs that meet in the middle in a valley where the water collects. So the building becomes an anal a poetic and functional analog to the landscape in which it finds itself. I think that's really, really a beautiful thing. And then the sleeping quarters. So here's that 
pocket door that sets into the shade fin. And then this really simple and yet very sophisticated assemblage of operable and fixed, fixed lights. So you wake up in the morning, you look outside, and the first thing you see is the river at dawn. And if it's raining, if it's sunny, you know what to wear. And so you're sort of choreographing the building and the relationship to the river to sort of register what's going on in the environment. Beautiful thing. OK. Now go back to the Pacific Northwest, hanging out with my ecologist friends again, start learning more about aquatic habitat. And I live in Salmon Nation. Some people call it Cascadia. People last week have been calling it Sovereign Cascadia. <laughs> And it, whoops, and it turns out that, um, you know, the salmon is this incredibly important cultural uh, symbol, not, not only for contemporary culture, but uh, Native American and First Nations peoples. This was not only a source of sustenance, but an incredibly important cultural symbol. It's thought to be one of the only cultures in the history of the world the Native Americans here who were sedentary non-agriculturalists, which is an interesting thing, because there was such an incredible abundance of fish. They say that historically there were 16 million fish that made their way upstream to the tributaries of the Columbia to spawn. It's under 1 million now. So it's not only a cultural symbol, but it's a symbol of the health of the broader ecosystem because it spends its life cycle history going from up through the watershed from upstream to the ocean and back. And there are dams that are preventing its free movement, salmon, the movement of free of salmon. But it's also my flashing detail, as it turns out, because I had no idea. When I was in school, this is a great flashing detail. You got your deck, you've got your ledger, bolts through to the rim joist of the wood frame house, you got your nice flashing detail up above. If you could afford it, you would use copper because it lasts forever. I had no clue that 12 parts per billion of copper in water is like horrifically bad for salmon. It basically, uh, all kinds of neurological problems, it basically loses its ability to defend itself in the case it's being attacked by a, a predator. I had no, no idea. My responsibility was to shed water away where it went and what happened to it. What quality it was, I had no idea. Was not my responsibility. So where I live and work, in the University of Oregon campus, you know, hundreds of years ago, that would have been a oak woodland, oak savanna. Um, people don't know this. It doesn't rain in the Pacific Northwest all summer long. It doesn't rain at all. We get rain from October to May, and maybe none from May to October. So over, over the course of the, so it starts to rain in January and the rain makes its way through the leaves and the fissures of the bark and leaf litter and very slowly it makes its way to the Willamette River a couple hundred yards away. And in that process it's cooled and cooler water holds more dissolved oxygen, it's cleansed and then when it hits the river it rains a lot in, the, in January, these side channels form these refugia, the river oversteps its banks, there's these side channels and the water's not moving as fast and little fish like calmer waters, so that's their refugia. So if we fast forward to today, we have all of, you know, it doesn't rain for months, motor oils, copper, other heavy metals are collecting on roadways, building surfaces, we get these first intense fall rains, all of those pollutants are making their way to the river in a hurry, it's warm water, oxygen poor, it's polluted. We've channelized the river, so we've put it in a pipe. More water's hitting it, and it's devastating. So we're, I work with Nat Schultz, who works with NOAA Fisheries in Seattle, who's looking at the ecotoxicology of urban streams. Coho salmon, there's like a 70% die-off trying to make their way through Seattle, Vancouver, Portland, and the like. So I've been working with an organization called Salmon Safe, looking at urban the urban form and water and uh, slowing, decelerating storm water flows and um, doing other things with that water that I'd like to talk about in a moment. So we have these significant non-point pollution problems, significant problems in terms of downstream effects, impacts of the way we construct cities. And I think that you all know this, but we also have 
scarcities that are only going to become more severe, particularly in the American West, west of the 100th mer meridian, um, significant scarcities that are only, you know, we've over allocated water in the Colorado River, for instance. That's maybe the most celebrated example. And with climate change, those shortages are going to grow. What gets, um, you know, the Pacific Northwest looks kind of friendly. Um, and it's expected that we will have the same amount of rainfall, but it's going to come in a different form. So rather than the drizzle, which characterizes six months of the year, we're going to have, it is expected, more intense rain events that are punctuation marks between more prolonged drought periods. Okay, that's number one. And then the other thing is, because of warmer temperatures, reduced snowpack in the mountains where our water comes from. And so reduced snowpack means forest fires. It also means, because it doesn't rain in August and September, we aren't going to have enough supply for our cities, for our uh, agricultural lands, and the like. So p water managers have this conundrum. They're thinking, well, maybe I should fill up the reservoirs with the spring rains. But that is also eliminates your flood control capacity. And so they're really stuck with this conundrum. So we have these aging infrastructures that were set up for a different climate regime. And then we could start talking about the energy water nexus, yet another. Oh, there's one other thing I'd like to say about supply, just really quickly. More and more Americans, urban dwellers, the for more and more, the majority of their drinking water is treated effluent from municipalities upstream. Okay? Houston is a great example of that. That's not a terrible thing. When we passed the Clean Water Act in 1972, we created the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, which controls the amount of various contaminants that enter our water and that can and leave a wastewater treatment plant. So chlorine and phosphate and other things. The issue is there are these, um, what are they called? Uh, Contaminants of emerging concern, that's the EPA term. These are things that are not currently regulated that include pharmaceuticals, personal care products, endocrine disruptors, things like that. We don't monitor those. So I work with this guy, Brent Bucknam, at Hyphy Design Laboratory. He's a water consultant. And he said, what keeps me up at night? It's not E. coli. We can definitely, this is not that hard. This is just basic chemistry and biology, but it's endocrine disruptors that are not being regulated in our water supply. That he said that completely freaks him out. Okay, so that, let's add the energy equation. The amount of energy we use to move water and the amount of water we use to produce energy is insane. It's unbelievable. We use water to cool power plants, basically, and millions and millions. More water used to cool power plants than is used in agricultural production in the United States. Okay. The largest infrastructure project in the history of the world, it's, this is called interbasin transfer. We take water from the Owens Valley to the east of the Sierras and pump it over the Tehachapis into um, to Los Angeles. So just a little bit of savings of demand equates to an incredible savings in terms of energy. So there's a famous 2005 California Energy Commission finding that 20% of the uh, electricity consumed in California is consumed moving water. So this should be the Hoover Dam. This is actually the Folsom Dam two summers ago during the severe droughts just east of Sacramento. That's Las Vegas. Just to kind of point out the kind of ironies that we're talking about. There's, there's been a trend to, to, build lead pla uh, the, to build luxury condos on the Strip in Las Vegas, like that's the second home for many. And they're building lead platinum luxury condos on the Strip, so that's a good thing. They're building lead platinum luxury condos with inoperable windows. The dam, the Hoover Dam, the water levels have receded so much that they came this close to having had to shut off the turbines. When you shut off the turbines, you initiate rolling blackouts. If you're in a luxury condo with inoperable windows in July, 
they estimate you have under 40 minutes to get out of a building or you asphyxiate, okay? So that's the highest environmental performance rated building in the United States today, okay? So this is a really great resource that I might recommend. And so David Sedlak says we really, to wean cities from centralized systems and all their problems, quality problems, energy problems, we might have to make decentralized supply and treatment practical <coughs> at higher population density. And there's also all kinds of ecological benefits to be derived from this approach that I'd like to talk about. So this is not the only approach. I'm actually not an advocate. There's a movement called Net Zero Water. I actually think we should be relying on existing infrastructures. Why, why have to re, you know, redouble our efforts in some instances? But we should, it should be part of the solution, what water managers call a portfolio approach to water management. So the city of San Francisco, for example, 85% of the water comes from the Hetch Hetchy Dam. That's in the you know, Yosemite, basically. That's interbasin transfer. Um, that water comes from snowpack. That snowpack is disappearing. They know that they have to do something and they have to do something fast. So that they're looking at alternative supply sources. They're looking at conservation, obviously. They're looking at, we don't use potable water for non-potable uses, for irrigating golf courses and for toilets. And then they're also encouraging a more localized approach to water infrastructure, a decentralized site scale approach to water infrastructure that I'd like to talk about. So what I get excited about, there's two water pedals in the living building challenge. One has to do with um, closed loop or captured precipitation, basically harvesting rainwater primarily. And the other looks at stormwater and downstream effects and minimizing ecological damage. What I get really excited about is I believe it's at the building scale and the site scale where we can actually begin to put into meaningful relationship issues of supply and issues of downstream effects. So if you think about buildings as thermal batteries that absorb heat during the day and you release that heat at night, we could actually think about buildings as hydrological batteries that we capture rainwater we put it to work for building occupants use, but we can use it for thermal mass, fire suppression, seismic dampening, sound attenuation. And then we can time the release of that water to adjacent water bodies when those water bodies need treated water the most. So we can actually think about buildings as functional components of urban watersheds and, and hydrological cycles. So I had the Acadia Association of Cle computer-aided design and architecture image up earlier, which had the image of, uh, for the adaptive architectures conference. This is what I mean by adaptive architectures. Thinking about the salmon earlier. Adaptive architectures are architectures that respond to biological phenomena and then change their behaviors and respond to benefit the parent ecosystem. So there's some movement, something changes, temperature movement in the urban ecosystem. It triggers a sensor in a building. The sensor communicates with other buildings and then they do something. They, they deliver water to the system when the coho salmon are trying to make their way up the river. Okay, so if you're an architecture student and you're interested in this, I really would encourage you just at, at a basic level to imagine water making its way th from the storm clouds or other sources onto your site, what's happening on the site, and where's it going next. And I love these, these are called Sankey diagrams where you show flows and the width of the arrow is the, the volume of water superimposed upon, in this case, a housing project, a redevelopment project in San Bernardino. So they're looking at harvesting rainwater, they're looking at using water for non-potable uses from the treatment plant, they're looking at infiltration, they're looking at gray water cycling. So the water comes in, it cycles through several times, and then it makes its way out. So think about that, the journey of a droplet of water through your site, it would be a worthwhile exercise. And then think about how you might be able to configure the site, and of course you're interested in 
solar orientation, you're interested in circulation, you're interested in parking, there are a billion things that you have to be responsible for. But it warrants thinking about how you might begin to manipulate the morphologies of buildings to support the site and broader hydrology. So this is a student of mine who was working on a housing project in Milwaukee, Oregon, which is just south of Portland on the Willamette River. And so she has these rows of housing. By the way, as someone pointed out, that site plan looks a lot like Homer Simpson's head. I just th I think it's a <laughs> very significant uh, aspect of the architecture. And so basically what's happening is the water from the, how the wings of housing collects, is delivered to a cistern. Excess water flows into this permeable alley. Instead of sheet flowing, it actually comes like this and meanders. And by the time it reaches the river, it's been cooled, cleansed, and, and oxygenated. And again, getting back to the project that I showed in the Netherlands, there's a social diagram, and there's an ecological diagram, and they're one and the same. Okay? Where people gather is where water gathers. And a similar uh, project on the same site uh, by Charlie Wilner, just really kind of a water-centric approach to thinking about urban form. But this is Oregon, and we think three-story buildings is high density, okay? Just, we're, we're having to change our view because we are, the city of Portland is growing by leaps and bounds right now. It's called rapid urbanization. But it's really start, it's interesting to start looking at these larger scale buildings. So Cook and Fox, one Bryant Park in New York, they collect all the rainwater. Rather than bringing it to a cistern in the basement and then pumping it back up, it's more of a passive approach. So they have storage on the 54th and the 43rd and the 32nd floor. And so it's localized distribution or the formation of these water precincts, which I think is really interesting. Those precincts are kind of buried. I think there's social architectural opportunities. You could create atria spaces and you could deploy water tanks clad in right, light reflective materials that distribute light to the re more recessed portions of the building that also function as thermal mass and on and on and on. I, I don't know, I'm just, just starting out on this journey. So I'm gonna, this is a little bit of a departure but not really. Going back to Australia um, after I had the great fortune of meeting Glenn Merkitt, who was a very humble man, by the way, and you can't say that of all architects. Um, <laughs> my wife, Kathy, and I went to New the Outback, and we went to this place called Mutawinji National Park, and that's it, those hills, and they're only a couple hundred feet above grade, you know, the normal grade, but because you're above grade, you can see forever. It's just, just haunting ancient landscape. But the, the, the point is, this is remnant rock that didn't erode, and the, the flat plain is all granular material. So it's hard rock, and you have vertical relief. And so you have hard rock and vertical relief. So when it does rain, it is captured in the rocks, you know, it's held by the rocks, and you have shade, so you don't have the kind of evaporative losses that you might otherwise experience. And so where you have hard rock and shade, you have water that collects. Where you have water, you have vegetation. Where you have vegetation, you have fauna. That was our tent, actually. And there was this scratching in the morning. I'm like, what the? And they're, they're kind of like deer in the United States. They just want us to feed them. Or and where you have fauna, you have the presence of human beings, OK? Similarly, and this is a beautiful book, Craig Childs is a science correspondent for NPR. He finds this map that Father Eusebio Kino made. He was a Jesuit missionary and geographer, spent a good part of his life in the late 17th and early 18th century in Tucson and other missions. And dozens of times he would take hides from Tucson through some of the most rugged country in the United States, southern Utah southeastern California to LA to get goods to bring back to the mission. And he never lost a mule or a man in 25 trips. And Craig Childs is like, how is that even possible? And so he finds this map of water holes, okay? And everybody is trying to find these water holes and they're all looking low and nobody had been looking high. And it turns out it's the mountains where there's these little declivities 
where it, when it rains, it captures it, and again, it's shaded, and it stays there. Whereas all the granular material down low, the water just seeps right, right down. A really amazing thing. Why am I saying this? Uh, last August, I was flying into Cairo to work on a project, and I'm flying over the city of 22 million forever, and it's these earthen colored buildings with cr cr very narrow streets between them. And my, I was thinking about my amazing landscape architecture colleague, Bart Johnson, who basically says, cities from an ecological point of view are essentially rock outcrops. Really good for shelf and cavity nesting birds, not a whole lot else other than people. But you could actually start to think about the uh, inherent advantages of urban environments from the standpoint of water harvesting, from minimizing evaporative losses, and from re recycling and reusing that water. So urban environments, hard urban surfaces, they're really good at directing water away from things really, really quickly. They could be equally good at holding on to that and, again, putting it to work in various kinds of ways. So this project in Cairo, and those do look like out rock outcrops. They don't have trash collection, so they bring stuff to the roofs. It's kind of an amazing, amazing thing. And I was invited there last summer to participate in a workshop that this guy, Nabil El Hadi, who's a professor at Cairo University, led the guy on the right. And then I met my El Abrashi, who runs an NGO called Magaura Built Environment Collective. And what she's doing is she's restoring these 11th century shrines in medieval Islamic Cairo. And the middle and the upper middle class have all fled to gated uh, suburbs. And so this part of the city is sort of falling apart. So she's looking at heritage conservation as a means of economic revitalization. So they're trenching out around these shrines to shore up the foundations and water's just pouring in lots and lots and lots of water. Some of it's probably rising groundwater, but the majority of it appears to be leaky supply pipes to all the tenements nearby. The water quality is horrific, but it's incredibly cheap, and there's no way those uh, property owners are going to repair those pipes. So I'm going back a month from today. I'll fly into Cairo, and we have a team of civil engineers, soil scientists, cultural anthropologists, historic preservationists, landscape architects, and me looking at the possibility of diverting that water to vacant alleys across from these shrines to create a sort of urban oasis where you can use that water, grow plants, create evaporative cooling. It was 115 when I was there during the day. And maybe that's a mechanism to bring more people to that area and bring back some economy. And one of the coolest things is we just found out a month ago that there's this uh, water collection infrastructure under old buildings that has been, is no longer used, large cisterns. This is called a sabil on the left. That was the place where um, it was a, like a, 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 a mirror would create a, uh, one of these and bring water to it and it would be free water for the people who lived here. That, it's no longer in use, but there are large cisterns under these throughout this neighborhood that are underutilized. So what we can do, it, depending on the amount of water, is we can use those, if there's just a lot of water flowing through past these foundations, divert it to this um, cisterns, and then use solar pumps to bring them up to these alleys. Um, so anyway, th we've just started this. We'll see how it goes. But a water-centric approach, it, like, it never fails. I swear to you, it never fails. OK, I just have a couple other projects I want to talk about. So. This is a studio that I um, led a couple years ago, and what we're going to do is see if the problem child of the urban environment, the parking garage, could be enlisted to perform ecologically beneficial work, is the hypothesis. And so I hope you get my architectural, inside architectural humor. A machine is a wetland for parking in. I'm riffing on Le Corbusier. I hope you know that. <laughs> I think all titles of studios should be riffs on famous lines from architectural history. I'm committed to that. Um, so this is a project in South Waterfront. Uh, it's a huge development uh, area in Portland along the Willamette River. That Where the blue is is called the Zydell property. 
And they used, uh, they built Liberty ships here during the Second World War, and then they dismantled the ships here after the war. As a result, the soils are full of PCBs and cobalt and other contaminants, some of which they removed, but they deemed it the safest to cap it in other locations. So what they did is they built a causeway, and they put a textile mat, geotextile mat, the thickness of an LP record across the entire site and then put new soil on top. I mentioned uh, Mark Wilson, an urban ecologist. He's like, that's great. That's your subsurface for wetlands. And the city's trying to reintroduce wetland complexes along the riverway because they're great for flood storage and perform other ecosystem services. This guy goes to construction sites and where there are staging areas and where construction equipment's moving back and forth. When they leave, he does perp tests of the soil and he goes to the city and said, those are the perfect subsurface characteristics for wetlands. Just add water and you've got them. So if we could proceed with a higher level of intentionality, the idea that construction processes are simultaneously regenerative ecological processes, I think is pretty, pretty incredible. In the early history of the parking garage, you would not only pay to park, but it'd be, it'd be a full service operation. You get an oil change tune up and car wash. So we're gonna reintroduce that idea in the studio. We're gonna gather water from the roof, neighboring roofs, the Ross Island Bridge. We're gonna pull it out of the hydrological cycle. We're gonna give the sequestered problem of the automobile. We're gonna give the cars a bath. We're gonna aggressively step cleanse that water. And then we're gonna time the release of that water to constructed wetlands that are part of the development of the project. And so this is important because our wetlands, what wetlands remain, are suffering from the fact that the hydrological regime, the climate is changing and we have drier, more prolonged dry periods, which means the hydro periods of the wetlands in the spring are much lower, the levels, which means macroinvertebrate populations are not reproducing. And that's big trouble because that's what birds rely on in other species. Okay, fish. So can we enlist the hard surfaces of the an urban environment to provide greater uh, predictability, hydrologic predictability in a time of greater climatic unpredictability is basically the premise. So this, we're not on, the, we're not a waterfront site. We're back up uh, inland a little bit, our site, but that's one person's image of what the site could look like. And here's a student team that's just looking at um, these kinds of relationships. There's a basic diagram that shows the, the flows and how it's going to be captured and, and what, what functions are going to be performed in that process. This project, I think, is fascinating. It's a mechanical lift parking garage. So you get out of the car. The car gets a bath. It's raised to a drying rack. You take the contaminated water. You feed it through the facades to grow algae. The algae cleans the water. You take that cleansed water and you create wetlands. And then you take the algae and you produce biofuels. Okay. So it's not going to solve our fuel crisis. I can guarantee you that. But it's an interesting idea. And just maybe we can make the motorcycle fit into the hydrological cycle. One last project from this, from this studio, this was an idea of almost these prosthetic de devices. These are these arrays of vegetative trays that the vertical circulation goes up around that cleans the water as it goes down. It's almost like parasites that you can attach to parking garages, you can attach to office buildings, any number of things. And they, they, they actually, thought that this could be a prototype that could be deployed in multiple locations along the riverway. They took their project to uh, the Cooper Union and they swept the, the architecture awards, third year undergraduate students. They won the interior design award for a parking garage. I think that's, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> okay, so you know, so I talked about the machine metaphor and the problematic nature of it. And I talked about the organism metaphor and maybe we've kind of gone to the polar opposite. And I actually start to think about the possibility of architectures as being hybrids of organisms and organic and inorganic elements, machines and organisms. So um, what, might it, what might that actually look like in a 
sort of water-centric approach. So one last studio project and then a couple final um, projects that are either in construction or, or finished by others. This is in Rome, some of the highest quality drinking water in the world. It makes its way through Travertine at Tivoli and then along the aqueduct and into the city. You can, if you've been to Rome, you know you can just drink water from public fountains, very high quality. But the water entering the Tiber is uh, incredibly bad <laughs> quality. And so they thought of, again, it's like a prosthetic device that you plug into a piazza where you walk down, it's summertime in Rome, it's brutally hot, there's cleansed water. You make your way up through, the, uh, between these concrete blocks that hold sand that filter storm water up to the roof. There's the ubiquitous uh, roof gardens of Rome in front of you and then the aqueduct, the, your source off in the distance. And then you make your way through these aromatic biofiltration trays that are treating the gray water to, in such that it's um, close to potable by the time it makes its way back down. So this is a sort of or, an organic machine, I would say. And this is obviously hypothetical, but here are some projects that are, are happening. So I mentioned Paul Kephart, California Academy of Sciences earlier. He was brought on to the team for the Trans Bay Terminal. And this is in downtown San Francisco. You have the BART system, you have taxis, you have buses, it's this transportation interchange. And as you know, the BART is well underground and you constantly have to supply fl fr fresh air down there and exhaust the very moist, stale air constantly. And the engineer and the architect, once we exhaust that air, we're done, right? The problem's over. It's like, no, we're gonna use that water to create an estuarine ecosystem on the roof that's gonna provide habitat for 17 endangered plants and eight endangered animals. So he's actually trying to put organisms and machines in some thoughtful relationship to one another. He's trying to think about water and buildings as having this really important set of interrelationships. Um, Hyphy Design Lab based in Oakland. They do, they're doing these living machine urinals out in public streets in San Francisco. I don't really get that. It's like a social experiment. <laughs> but they're taking the water from evaporative coolers and they're bringing them to roofs. And there are cities in California that say you have to use drought tolerant natives on the roofscape. And he said, that's crazy because you've created a new morphology. You've created rock outcrops. You've introduced water. You should put lush plants on the roof. You're gonna reduce the cooling loads of the building dramatically. And then he's got living walls that are actually the first step in the recycling of gray water making their way down. And then water's then growing the living wall, which is pre-treating the air, which is making its way into the building. It's providing an evaporative cooling for people inside the building. It's providing you know, higher level of air quality, visual amenity, really just thinking about a water-centric approach to making architecture. And, la and second to lastly, have two more slides. So he was then, Brent Buckham Hyphy Design Laboratory, brought on to do the living wall for uh, Snow Heta's SF MoMA edition. It's a beautiful living wall. But they didn't know where the water was gonna come from. So he calculated on a typical day of visitations, there are 1,200 gallons of condensate buildup inside the building. That's human sweat. And we're gonna direct that to the living wall. That's more than enough water to grow the, for the living wall. So now we're gonna use human physiology as part of the landscape solution. I think that's pretty radical. And what I, I have colleagues who are pioneers uh, at the University of Oregon in passive heating, cooling, and lighting, and ventilating of buildings. Um, and one of the things they constantly dwell on and encourage is if you think about climate optimization and uh, buildings uses and organization and orientation, and you're really trying to optimize building form in relationship to climate, you're gonna end up with a building that actually belongs in that place. It's a place-based architecture. And what interests me is if we take a water-centric approach we could also start to think about a place-based architecture where a, where a project exists in the watershed will suggest what its functions are in terms of its ben benefits to the parent ecosystem at the same time, of course, that it's solving interior problems, that's providing comfort and doing all the things we need to do to support human activity. 
So anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. There's a whole lot of other radical uh, developments taking place. Wastewater, I'm telling you, in 20 years, we're not going to call it waste and we're not going to call it water because it's not going to be either. There's some really amazing uh, conversion to energy processes that are going on that are going to start to make their way into uh, our everyday environments and on and on and on. And I think it's really important that if you're going to be a next generation of architects and you are aware of these, the crisis that's impending, there are ways that we can respond and create really exciting and meaningful work as a result. Okay, thank you very much. And that's a Vox Swift, by the way. They come out of the chimneys, like out of the cave, the bats. They come out of chimneys in Portland. It's a big event, like the bats here are in Austin. They're really, really cool. Yes. It could be, it's, it's pretty aggressive in terms of the environmental control systems part of the curriculum. We have people like Allison Kwok who wrote the Green Studio Handbook and Jeezy Brown who wrote Sun, Wind and Light. I call it Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, we have some really, so, and that's introduced early on. And one of the things also that's been a tradition at the University of Oregon is that we don't make distinctions between technology classes and design classes. Anybody who comes to teach at the University of Oregon, if they come to teach structures, they teach studio. I, I don't know what the climate and culture is like here. I do know that other schools, there's a sharp divide. These are the folks who teach technology. These are the designers. And there's this barrier. And we think of it much more fluidly. So I do think that's a good thing. Um, I do think we fall a little bit. I think we could do a lot more. So I mentioned Bart Johnson. He teaches this incredible course called Applied Ecology. And it's mostly for landscape architecture majors. But it's all about how design interventions interact with dynamic systems. And I think that should be a required course. That's what I've been pushing for architecture students. So whenever a student has an opportunity to take an elective, I'm trying to encourage them to take classes like that. I also direct a graduate certificate in ecological design, which is a complement to your master's study. And that would give you an opportunity if you wanted to study water or energy you could take industrial ecology and management, and you could take the physics of energy and physics, or you could take the geography of water and geography and water law and law, and you could really start to carve out an area as a complement to your architectural degree to really give you the ability to go work in the kind of firm or other professional environment where you have a record of sustained inquiry in the issues that these innovative firms are really uh, committed to. Uh, one back and then Steven because I keep. Yeah. Um, is there a way in which this um, whole water center approach, or I guess a more direct ecological response to the you know building, um, influences the issue of CD planning in a way, or is it just like singular solutions, or, or is there a spectrum in which you know it starts molding out? There, so I, that's a very good question. And so because I'm an architectural, my background is an architectural prog practice. I've tended to focus on the site scale. There's this whole eco districts movement that you might be aware of that it may be that the optimal s infrastructure scale is not in many instances, excuse me, is not at the building scale, but it might be at the district scale. I think different conditions, different hydrological conditions, different building types might suggest a more optimized scale. The thing that's really interesting about eco districts is they're actually trying to create financial models whereby your site is high and dry and great for collecting sun and my site is low and wet and great for collecting water. So instead of the Grizzly Adams loner sustainability like I have to do a zero energy building, um, 
there's advantages to uh, deriving synergies in the urban environment. So eco districts is predicated on the idea that it's that district scale where the sweet spot exists, that the city scale is just too fraught and complex politically, and maybe uh, we could be more resource efficient if we were sharing pooling resources at, at that district scale. Take a look at that. They have conferences. You can get eco district certified, like you can get certified for just about everything else in this <laughs> nation. Stephen. Uh, first of all, that was terrific. Thanks very much. Um, it, it seems uh, that one way to describe what you're doing is trying to think through or think beyond the classical cultural barriers we've had to thinking about buildings as locations where we consume energy and water and food, and infrastructures are the things that provide, provide one-way flows to buildings. And so you're creating two different kinds of hybrids. That, of course, leads to, when you start getting to the planning scale, huge problems in terms of regulation. Sure. And so are you working with anybody who's, who's thinking about that or has made uh, any headway in thinking about new kinds of regulatory formats? Um, it, that, so the person that I feel is the most knowledgeable is this guy at Hyphy Design Lab that I mentioned. His name is Brent Bucknam, and he's doing some work. So the, the issue with a decentralized approach is different municipalities have been more willing to go out on a limb than others. And so every municipality has its own uh, structure and it's permitted in certain places and not permitted in other places so you're a designer working on a well, we did it in this one way in this location and it worked really well and we could translate that knowledge to this different location and you can't do it in this location so i think some level of standardization is really required and there's an enormous amount of work to do and it's an enormous problem actually um, but we do have pilot projects like the bullet center in seattle which is a very innovative project with respect to water and they basically decided we're going to spend millions of dollars on this building and we're going to go and you know bat, do battle with the city and we're going to lose our shirts on this project but we're a heavily endowed entity and we're going to make open that knowledge available in an open source kind of way so i feel like we're on the crux of something but even even water rights law which is incredibly antiquated in the american west It'd be great if there are cities in the United States where you could not capture your water on site because that water has already been allocated for downstream uses, which is a whole. And even in Oregon with relatively high abundant rainfall, we are confronting the reality where these historical water rights are competing against climate change and growing populations. And we're, we're going to hit, we're, gonna, we're on our way toward a collision course. And, we have people in our law program that are looking at this issue right now and trying to figure out ways of modernizing our water laws so that we can actually do do things in a local scale. But it's a, a really important question and a huge, huge issue. Huge. Yes. Um, yeah, really thought provoking, and um, you know, you really it seem, you seem to be sort of suggesting really. Kind of path-breaking or new innovative way to think about it, and, and but it's all. I guess the, the critique or the, or the concern or the problematic is like all like early innovations, these seem to be really expensive yeah. and one off. And I know some of the research and there's some research done here at the Middlebury Johnson Wildflower Center on yeah. good roofs is that these, you know, when you bring flora and fauna into the building environment, it's actually the systems and the design require, you know, require incredible amount of thought and care. The maintenance of these systems in, in many built environments requires incredible attention and care. Uh, so they become, you know, as, as kind of one-offs, and as unique projects, extremely expensive. Yeah, I, I contest that. So uh, for a couple of reasons. So I go back to the project in the Netherlands. That was cheaper, okay? That was cheaper than a typical building. We're, well, I'm working with these folks in Hyphy. We're going to be doing a studio in the winter. We're calling it passive hydrology, 
we're going to use gravity and atmospheric pressure to move water. We're going to use capillary wick ropes to lift water. We're not going to use pumps. We're, gonna, we're actually going to minimize the use of uh, mechanical means to distribute and move water and see what we can come up with. So, well, that, so that's the really the fundamental question is the question of stewardship. And that's something that Stephen has written a lot about. And so if we're going to commit to sailing a ship instead of running a motorboat, there are going to be questions of stewardship, which are tr you are right, uh, that are truly at the heart of this question as to whether it warrants decoupling. In, in, some, in, in all or part of this, do you see real possible prospects for moving innovation down the product chain? Oh, yeah. Getting into more standardization, De lowering the cost curve? Yeah, so look at the what the fluidized bed reactors at Stanford, this entity, or the there's the Swiss Institute for Water and Wastewater Research, it's EW E A W A G, and they're trying to commercialize wastewater technologies that are really promising and really radical, as an example. And so I there is a lot of work in commercialization of these kinds of systems. In that in that case, just the, I'll, I'll I'm gonna Leave us with a couple thoughts on urine, okay? I think that would be appropriate. <laughs> urine is where it's at from the standpoint of nutrient recovery, not feces, okay? <laughs> because there's a finite amount of phosphorus in the world, and there's a lot of phosphorus in urine. So what they're doing is they're creating these localized systems that harvest the energy of feces to create a nutrient precipitate out of urine which then suddenly your transportation costs are radically reduced because, you know, the honey bucket is heavy. And suddenly you have a nutrient pack to grow things, whether in the exurban periphery or within the urban environment itself. There are things happening right now with respect to water and waste that people are looking at very hard ways of scaling this stuff up. Because the idea of putting our poop in potable water and sending it to a water body, which we then have to treat. I mean, let's think about the costs in terms of health, in terms of energy, and all these other things. And that's something else we need desperately is some economists who are looking at the reality that we are confronted with needing to spend billions of dollars on our water infrastructure at a time when we're cutting municipal budgets and at a time when the feds used to provide grant assistance for cities to build these treatment plants. That money is dried up. I think there's a kind of a financial inevitability associated with entrepreneurship looking at localized approaches because we're not seemingly willing or capable of dealing with it at the large scale. Okay, thanks. In short, the future is going to be one gigantic pissing match. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brooke. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate yeah, it.